Hello, welcome to Thank You for Your Service on Wisconsin Rapids Community Media. <clears throat> Today we will be interviewing somebody that's very, very familiar to the veterans in Wood County, Wood County Veterans Officer Rock Larson, who was also an Air Force and Army National Guard veteran. Rock, thank you for your service. My pleasure. Okay. Two services. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, explain when you first went in what... Uh, okay, well I first for some reason, I don't really have a identifiable one. I always wanted to join the Air Force. So when I was in high school, I, end of my senior year, I joined the Air Force. Spent the summer partying, as we used to do in Wisconsin as teenage, uh, teenagers back in the 70s, and then uh, in the fall went into the Air Force. So uh, why I switched over to the Army is a whole different story down the line. So. Okay, so <clears throat> how old were you when you actually joined the Air Force? I was, uh, when I actually enlisted, I was 17. It was the late entry, and I went after my 18th birthday. Okay, so where were you living at the time? Uh, I was living with my parents in wonderful Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> so you entered from Green Bay, Wisconsin. Went to saw the recruiter, and yep. where'd, where'd you go? Went in, uh, wanted to... Wanted to get into the electronics field, because that's what I thought I wanted to do. And so I went in, get down, get down to the MEP Center, the day I'm leaving, and I say, you're colorblind, you can't do electronics. <laughs> but, so I went like all Air Force recruits do, I uh, went to Lackland Air Force Base, and um, through basic training there, and in basic training, they figured, you know, they said, you know, we'll assign you to some MOS at that time, or a AFSC in the Air Force. So. Uh, Seeing I was colorblind, and I mean, I can see some colors, but that's beside the point. I couldn't be in an electronics field, so I ended up being in a uh, radio communications analysis specialist, which is basically a, <clears throat> a person who take, took foreign intercept done by either Morse code or linguists, and you were a Morse code guy for the Army, uh, and then I would take that data and try to make sense out of it with the intercepted. So that's what I ended up being. Our advanced training was in um, Goodfellow Air Force Base, which is a World War II base, and they, they had done some upgrade on that, uh, or were starting to. I, I lived in old World War II barracks there. I remember pulling into some town on the way, we were on a bus, and I'm pulling in and they've got like diagonal parking on the main street and there's nobody to be seen, as, and a tumbleweed's rolling down the main street, and I'm like, oh God, let's not, hopefully this isn't where we're going, because I'm gonna be there for six, seven months, so. But it went to Goodfellow Air Force Base, uh, which is an interesting uh, town. It was, uh, it was a dry town, which was different from Green Bay in the 70s. <laughs> um, so, so I finished my advanced training there and went on, they split us up into Two groups, a European specialty and a Far East specialty, and I ended up in the Far East and went on to, uh, my first duty assignment was uh, Kadena Air Base, and I worked on actually an Army base, Tori Station, on Okinawa, Japan. I spent a year and a half there. So when you went in, did you go in alone or did you have some friends go in with you? I went in, the guy in basic training, the bunk next to me was a guy that I worked, went to high school with and we worked at McDonald's together. But you didn't know that he signed up? No, oh, no, we did. We signed up and we went through together. Uh, actually, the two of us signed up and gave credit to a third friend who had an earlier uh, date. And he actually ended up being a, uh, a linguist and worked Intel, but he was uh, Arabic. So he was on the other side of the world when I was. But so he went in before us, he got credit and a stripe for both of us enlisting us, and we went through together side by each in basic training, and then he went off to uh, a different duty station, and I went off for further training. And so you had to have a top secret clearance, didn't you? I had a top secret clearance, yes. <coughs> and they had to do a background on you. And they did, yeah. yeah. I was home on, on leave when they were doing that. It was interesting. <laughs> and some of your friends got a hold of you, and... Yeah, everyone was saying, hey, there's these guys, badges, all around talking, asking questions about you. All your, my former employers, you know, was McDonald's and uh, 
the grocery store I worked at and things like that. Some of my teachers, my best friend, I put his father down as the as a reference, but they ended up talking to him because he was home from college too. So it was um, somehow they must have all uh, omitted certain things, and I, and I got my clearance. Okay, <clears throat> first days in the military, nervous? Oh yeah, it's just you know, you're young. Uh, first first time I was on an airplane, you know, flew to, flew to San Antonio. You're down there and. Nobody tells you before you go in, really, that, hey, they're just going to be messing with you just to see if you can handle it, you know, make-believe stress. This is, you know, the end of the Vietnam War is when I went in. We were still had some troops over there, and uh, it, was, uh, it was definitely different. I, I, I remember the first words out of my drill instructors, uh, but we can't repeat those here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was interesting, and communal living was, was interesting. Drill instructors, what do you remember about those guys? Well, once again, this is Air Force, so it's a little different than you know, the Marine Corps or, or, or even the Army, but uh, they were interesting. You know, at a certain point through, when they weeded out most of the people that weren't going to make it, they, they, they kind of changed and they became real people, you know, again. But before, yeah, you didn't know if they were joking or if they were straight-faced or they're, you know, it was, uh, it was definitely different. Uh, I'm sure it's changed a lot since, but it was different. So where was your AIT at, your advanced training? Uh, it was um, Goodfellow Air Force Base, which is uh, San Angelo, Texas. There's a San Angelo uh, State University. In fact, many, many years later, I traveled through there on a um, Third Corps exercise when I was went to the dark side of the Army. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> you're done with your AIT, your advanced training. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go from there? First duty station. Kadena Air Base, um, Okinawa, Japan. So we're on this little small 67 by seven mile island. Um, I was stay, uh, billeted in, I remember getting off the plane first off and it was like, bam, you know, 98% humidity and about 95 degrees. Yeah, you, you go take a shower and put a clean uniform or clean clothes on. As soon as you walked out of the air-conditioned barracks, um, you just you know, turn around and want to go back in and take another shower and put on. And we had air-conditioned barracks because we shared the barracks with the. Uh, we had the 6990th. Um, the 6928th, which I was in, and then there was another, and I can't remember what there, and I should. Anyway, we had an airborne platform which had uh, linguists that would fly, and they they didn't have uh, the analysts assigned to them. Then we had the ground platform, which I was, I, I was on, which was a 6928th at the time, and we actually worked on Torrey Station, but we lived on Kanina Air Base. But because we had people on flight crew, living in our barracks, we had air conditioning. So they had one wing and we had another wing. Uh, whereas the, the poor army guys, when we went to Torrey Station, because it was a, one of those weird things that the military decides, well, we're gonna do this joint operation, seeing it's on an army base because they have all the antennas. Um, we'll have army Morse code intercept operators that worked with you. Well, those poor guys were, and gals were, you know, three to a room, no air conditioning, getting up and doing PT and doing all these extra duties and stuff that the Army was famous for. And I was going back to my single air conditioned room. <laughs> so, granted, I had to take a half hour drive, bus ride to and from work, but it wasn't bad for what, what we got uh, out of it. So it was, it was interesting. And then the Army, they were on straight shifts. So, because we were 24-7, 365 operation. We would have the army guy. Army shifts were all either you got there and you worked straight mids your entire time there, or straight days, or you know occasionally there'd be someone to jump from from um, one shift to another, but not often. Um, and we worked uh, a California swing. We worked four swing shifts, four mids, four <coughs> days. Then we got four days off. So 
we rotated through all these different uh, army groups. So it's interesting. I know some of my friends went to Torrey Station after Vietnam, so I, I might little, have ran into one or two. May have. Okay, so you're in Okinawa. Yep. How long a time were you there? It was a non-command sponsored tour for me, so it was a year and a half. And um, they wanted me to extend, and I'm like, why would I want to extend here? <laughs> it was horrid. Um, oh, it was a beautiful place, but I got there a couple years after we'd given it back to the, Jap to the Japanese. So the Japanese were ruling it with an iron thumb. The Okinawans were upset with us because we gave it back to the Japanese instead of giving them the, their independence. So it was a little different, and you know, there was not a lot of things for a, uh, not a lot of opportunity for, for a 19, 20, and 21 year old uh, single GI, <laughs> um, if, if you catch my drift. I mean, there was, I had, a, I think, three dates in a year and a half. And, yeah, it was not good. Um, so you're over there in Okinawa. Were you able to go to any other islands or to the mainland of Japan? Well, I had, I had a bunch of friends from high school school that were in college and I don't know that must have been pretty well off they were going to Hawaii so I put in an application for leave to go to Hawaii and meet up with actually uh, my ex-girlfriend and, and, and some of her um, girlfriends and and they said no we can't let you go you're mission essential well that was the wrong thing for them to say because now that was just a license to you know I can get away with just about anything because I'm mission essential <laughs> so, so no I didn't because uh, for most of the time Nine months that I was there, I had order, follow-on orders already to Shilinko Air Station in Taipei, Taiwan, where a bottle of Johnny Walker Red paid your rent downtown <laughs> for a month in downtown Taipei. Well, the day I shipped my whole baggage, so everything I owned other than a, you know, your duffel bag, left. I went into work that night, and they canceled my orders. We had started... Um, Henry Kissinger had met with um, the Chinese and we started formalizing negotiations and as part of that was we were going to move all our bases out of Taiwan. So this is like two weeks out so they can't, they are going to reopen the intel site at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines but they hadn't started that yet so they weren't sending anybody new um, so I ended up going back to the states okay. and they found a job for me type thing and so I ended up going back to actually Kelly Air Force Base, which is right next to uh, Lackland Air Force Base. So your initial enlistment was it four years? Four years. Four years. Okay, so you do a year and a half. So you're about two years yeah, plus. A little over two years into, into my your yeah. agreement. So now you're back in the states, doing your job here. Yeah. How long did you stay down there? Uh, just about. Just under two years, I was, um, I got an early out of about 10 days to, to start college. Um, I had a weird job. It was, um, because I was in an overseas imbalanced career field, most of us were overseas at that time, they had to send people back to the States so they had to like make jobs. So I'm in this job and I do things from painting offices one day to writing policy letters to the Air Force Chief of Staff's office next and it was it was the Air Force Communication Security Center where we worked um, we worked to, to secure our communications so that other foreign entities couldn't exploit them like we were doing in Okinawa <laughs> or you in, 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 in Vietnam and stuff mm -hmm. so so I worked the, just the other side of the fence trying to doing OPSEC surveys and things like that and testing new machine new equipment for our field units because I worked in the headquarters and they had a field unit that was in Okinawa and uh, one that was in Berlin, another one in Han, Germany, and, and one in uh, Chicksands, and another one in the and one in the states. I actually went TDY back to the Far East with the people that I shared a barracks with, only in, in Osan, Korea, and we did a uh, we tapped telephones for a month over there. So, so it's interesting that equipment that you were working on at that time was cutting edge, new stuff. Some stuff was, yeah, really. It had, no, it's it, had, it had uh, cassette tapes, <laughs> you know, recorders, and and uh, it was starting to be digital. That was, you know, you remember the old, uh, what do they call the big R, the 
big rack radio that you R three nineties. R three nineties. Yep, that's what we had in Okinawa. You know, so. but we were getting back got back in the states. We were dealing with microwave stuff where you just take a tr truck. We, we bought, uh, I think it was one for each field field unit, and they were going out, and they were a cube van, and you could go out and set up outside of wherever near a microwave tower and just start collecting all that stuff. So all that stuff that you hear about uh, people doing NSA, monitoring all our stuff, they were starting that. And the, the computer programs that would filter uh, keywords and stuff, that was starting. There was a guy doing that in Okinawa. He was a uh, he was an MIT graduate, had really long hair, and you know, so we're all short haired, and he was a civilian working with all these computers and and stuff, computers about the size of this table and stuff, and he was telling me all this stuff because in the middle of the night, there wasn't a lot of Chinese up flying aircraft and doing stuff, so we were just kind of... So what year was that? That year was probably 1976. Because I got to Okinawa in summer of 75. So was there for the fall of the, the Saigon and, and stuff like that. So a lot of the stuff we hear on the news now is 50 years old. It's starting, yeah, it was starting 50 years ago already. The technology, the basis of just being able to do that, the data, they were closing bases overseas and starting to use, uh, at that time it was more uh, U2s and stuff that were flying antennas and then they would data stream that data back up via satellite to, uh, to the states and then analysts and Morse code operators or uh, linguists would be taking it there. Uh, now it's directly from the satellite they're doing a lot of that stuff. But there's still some, you know, the weak, uh, I can't remember, is it UHF or? UHF or VHF? Or, or VHF where the voice, and it doesn't travel long, it doesn't bounce off of the atmosphere like other forms of communication. Those are still being done with um, I think it was this morning on the news where there was a Russian jet flew within five feet of a U.S. Intel plane, and that's what that plane's doing. It's 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 collecting those energies, and they could be doing a photo recon or, or, but most of that's done satellite now, thermal imaging. So you got out of the Air Force. You're down in Texas, correct? No, I, well, I got out of the Air Force in Texas. Came back home. My mother was was ill with cancer, so I came back to Green Bay. Went to college, and I was in, in the process of my college career. I was, the GI Bill isn't as lucrative then as it is now. I was running a little low on money and whatever, so I'm like, well, saw an ad in, in the paper, school paper about a Try One program for the Army National Guard. Because I already looked at the Air Force National Guard, and they didn't have anything in the Fox Valley where I was going to college, and they didn't. Um, <clears throat> And they didn't have any intel things anyway, so I'd have to retrain anyway. And I said, join the National Guard for one year, try one prior service people. So I'm like, okay, paid my rent for the month. And, um, so I tried that. <clears throat> I dropped out of grad school because my mother was terminally ill then and in home hospice, and I dropped out to health care. The bottom came out of the uh, economy back then in the, in the mid-'80s. Um, That's probably 80. 384, and then uh, all of a sudden uh, the National Guard had a big push for it. come on active duty. So you know, same pay as an active duty soldier, same benefits, same retirement plan, except you stayed in Wisconsin unless they mobilized your unit. So I joined the it's called, uh, uh, Active Guard and Reserve Program. It's a different title of uh, the U.S. Code, Title 32 as opposed to Title 10, and and spent 17 years uh, active duty for the Army National Guard. And retired uh, with 21 and a half years of active duty time for, for retirement. So you're in college. You've been out of the military for a few years. And you joined the Army National Guard. Were you able to transfer your rank over, or did you lose a stripe? I, I came in. It was you know, <clears throat> this was after the draft and after you know. Uh, uh, so the guard was really having a hard time recruiting people. So I kept my same rank. Came in, you know, uh, spec four at the time. You know. I OJT'd as an 11B, 
<laughs> so I never went to Fort Benning. Uh, so 11B is infantry. Infantry, yep, target 101. <laughs> and uh, did that, then, I, then they needed someone to take, take the chemical position in the unit and they offered it to me. So I went to a, 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 an, active act, an actual active duty transition course. I spent three, three months on Fort McCollum uh, my mother had passed away by then, uh, and uh, this was still when I was part-time, uh, weekend uh, soldier. Uh, so I spent three months, got my basic NCO course out of the way, and a transition new MOS to chemical uh, corps. Got back and they said, well, we need you in the, in the infantry position again. <laughs> so they moved me over as a squad leader. And that's when I took the, uh, I got the job uh, in Wausau, I was in Oshkosh. I got the job in Wausau as a, a battalion chemical NCO, AGR, full time. So it came in um, E6 at that time. I'd already, in the three years I was in the guard, I'd been promoted twice. So it was, it was a pretty good gig. So you didn't have to go back to basic training or anything? You no, just... didn't have to go back to basic training. Didn't, uh, I did, um, you know, NCO course here in the States on weekend with the Army Reserve. Then I did the active duty one, which saved me having to go back because the AGR people did and they decided, well, you need to have seen your active duty. You have to have your active duty NCO course, not a week, not a guard one. Like, I already got mine. <laughs> so then I had to go back for a second one before, to, to make E7, but. Okay, so now you're in Wausau. I'm in Wausau, an armor battalion. I'm a Intel, I remember, well, the first thing I remember in the Guard is we're out at Fort McCoy and we're all in our armored APCs going across the, you know, the, the battle line there. And I'm looking across and I'm like, hmm, one antenna, one antenna, one antenna, two antennas. I know which one I'm shooting at first. <laughs> so the same thing when I got into the armor battalion, you know, the tanks, you'd have one, you know, and all of a sudden, that one has more antennas. That's the first target. This, this, there's a problem here. So, uh, so it's amazing. Well, it's no wonder lieutenants had a short life span because <laughs> uh, lieutenants were always with the ones with two radios. So, but I was in the armor battalion. Had a great uh, spent two and a half years there, and we would go to Fort McCoy just like the infantry unit would always go to Fort McCoy. So that was interesting. Uh, then I joined a unit called a RAOC, a Rear Area Operations Center, and I got hired into that unit because I told the, the full-time um, officer, the head officer, that I could do a database that would track, um, this is back when, they didn't have any computers in the, in the Guard and Reserve, uh, but I could write a database that I could tell you where all the units were in Europe as they transitioned through the war plan. Because on day one, your unit may pull out and move forward, another unit's coming in from England, another unit's leaving the States, and there was all three by five cards mm -hmm. and a big war plan describing all this. So I wrote this um, database that could only really teach like three people in the unit to really understand how it worked, because nobody really understood data back then in the, in the, in the Guard and Reserve, um, and active duty for that matter. It was such a new, but, um, but I got it all done, and it was a classified. It was a, a classified database, and you have to courier the the program and the data over and back from from Ger Germany. We go over there, and, but in what would take a couple hours, I could have an answer of people going through these cards and checking it. I could say, hey, there's an explosive ordnance team here, there's a firefighting team here, there's a bridge unit there, and I'd have it in seconds. And uh, the generals like that. So you were still in Wausau when you came up with this? or No, you... that I'd moved to uh, Hartford, Hartford, Wisconsin, which and is uh, into Dodge County. No, Washington, Washington County. Aaron I Hills. lived in Dodge County. I lived over the county line in Dodge County. So um, so, so no, th that unit there in Hartford, what was their basis? Or? They were a rear area, a theater level rear area operations center. So they would go in at X day of the war, and they would fall in on the 5th ASG in Stuttgart, Germany, and it would cover about a quarter of Germany. And all the and it was kind of like a 911 center. We would help uh, plan 
ahead for emergencies. So we'd coordinate with this base commander or this uh, unit on, on setting up their defenses and, and what have you and their resources. But when the, when the crap hit the fan, they would call us and then we would task resources from another base or something to come and assist them. And, and so, so a lot of logistics. You know, well, just, we had people, it was a 80 man unit that had a lieutenant colonel, three majors, uh, a whole bunch of captains. And we had armor, infantry, uh, chemical, EOD, engineers, MPs, both officer and enlisted. So it was, a, it was a really interesting unit. Plus we got to go to Germany two or three times a year. Okay. Incidentally, my daughter left for Europe this morning, so. <laughs> Going to Germany. Germany's one of the stops, yep. Okay. So, when you were over in Germany, <coughs> would you be doing what they used to call war games? Oh, yeah. We did. Started with command post exercises, and then they, then they went to uh, more, uh, which means you're not out in the field. But we had some that would go out to the, to the Pompkiss sites where, where you'd walk into this big uh, controlled environment warehouse and in there would be a whole battalion or greater size of tanks, uh, recovery vehicles, jeeps, whatever it was, you know, it was all right there ready to go. The only thing that wasn't there was the ammo and the ammo was at an ammo dump obviously. So, um, so we had some people working at those things, and it would be, the exercises changed on, on, on the level of uh, complexity. Then towards the end, they had simulated exercises where they had, a, the, the computer games were starting that. Mm -hmm. So those were kind of interesting, where they'd have the, the suits and the tie guys, we call them, and they'd come in and they, well, this is how the game's gonna work, and you, we're gonna go two, th two thirds real time, or one third real time, so, what would normally take 30 minutes is only going to take 10 minutes for you to do, you know, to travel these distances on, in the game and, and, and whatever. So it was, it was very interesting. It was the end of the Cold War. The wall was just coming down, you know. It, it, was, it was very interesting. Um, and we was, we, we'd line up. I mean, we'd, we'd had German counterparts would be right there. We'd be working with the German Army. We'd be working with the German, uh, oh, I can't remember what they called them now because this is back in the 90s and I've killed those brain cells. Um, or they just dropped off, yeah. Um, they, had the, they had their work battalions as opposed to their military, they had just work battalions set up too that would be mobilized to, to do whatever needed to be done there, so it was. So you spent a couple of years with Hartford because you said you went twice to Germany? Oh, we'd go two or three times a year. Oh, two or three times a year, okay. And then we'd also go another uh, annual training. We'd go to uh, San Luis Obispo in California because the unit we worked for in the MOB plan, as it went in, the, the, the unit in Germany would move forward. A California Guard unit would come in, and they would be the logistic um, and supply portion and the personnel portion. They were doing all the orders, moving equipment and stuff. And we were the um, operations and intel side. We would have, so we would, and that's where we fell in. We're their, um, if you're Army, we're the S2 and S3 portion of this um, area support group. So we'd go there and the Germans would fly over to California. They like that. <laughs> um, and um, and you'd you know, work hard. and meet all these people and... Do you stay in touch with any of these people? No, no. Well, a couple of the guys in, in, the, in the guard unit, but nobody from the German or the California. They've all dropped off over the years. Uh, and then I went to, after I left, well, I didn't leave Hartford. They, they reorganized the unit and made us a core level REAC and a theater level REAC. So there was two units there. And uh, so now I did the same type of work, but in the core rear, behind the division lines, but before the core, before the theater lines at the end of the core. So we'd work in there. Uh, and those we would go, we, we aligned for a while with 18th Airborne Corps, so we'd go down to Fort Bragg. We aligned with Third Corps at Fort Hood. We went to Fort uh, Lewis with I-Corps for an exercise. 
And that at third core, Fort Hood, that's where we did a roadrunner exercise where you actually took all your actual equipment and it was just the command post, it wasn't the it wasn't the the infantry divisions or the armor divisions that were assigned there, but just the headquarters and, and and the and the core support command and, and things like that. And we did um, an exercise over real world we'd go 150 mile jumps and set up in a car in a, in a cattleman's uh, range and then move a day or two to another one and whatever. So, it was a, so Hartford closed down. And where did you go from there? Did you, or were you still based in Hartford? We were still based in Hartford for a while. <coughs> and then all of a sudden they did a total guard reorganization and they had two armories that nobody else wanted. And, and nobody, you know, the, the only people that in my unit, because it was 27 men and women, um, and we had a, still a lieutenant colonel, three majors, seven captains, um, so they came from all over the state to be in this unit. Uh, so, so they moved us to Berlin. So I still lived outside of Hartford. I'd gotten married while I was in that unit uh, to, a, to a young lady from Slinger, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. which is right next to Hartford. And then, uh, so I'd commute 60 miles to work every day, which isn't a lot, but, and um, so we were in the Berlin Armory. So I did that for quite a few years and I was stuck. I could never get promoted because the only E8 positions were in organic battalions. And they always hired their E7s. Mm -hmm. So I decided I'll just, uh, and as, as they move you in the guard and reserve or active duty, the amount of money you get paid is based on, um, you got your rank, but then you also have the cost of living in your area, the housing. Well, the housing in Hartford was in the Milwaukee metropolitan area, one of the highest in the state. In Berlin, it was one of the lowest in the state, you know, even though it's only about a you know, hundred miles different. So I lost a lot of money. So I took a transfer to state headquarters of all things and worked at uh, in the mobilization office of the operations section uh, at state headquarters. Which is in? In Madison, right next to the airport. Then from there, a uh, the guy who used to work, he was a recruiting um, manager, had his office in Hartford just across from my, became the state command sergeant major. So he calls me into his office one day and says, hey, we got this job opening. E8, they put these new program in, which was more point-based than buddy-based. <laughs> And uh, I, because I had 12 years as an E7, and I had a college degree, and you know, all these things. But the only thing I didn't max out on was the physical fitness test sc or scores, and there was, so I was the number one on the list. He says, you know, it's your job if you want it. And it was in uh, Appleton. And I didn't move, and I wasn't gonna move, because I'm like, I'm a year and a half from retirement. And they wanted a two-year commitment. So I said, well, I just happened to have a briefing there the next couple days that I'm driving up there to give that and I'm going to drive directly from my home so I'll know exactly how long it's going to take me to get there and, and, and whatever. And so I took it, took the job, ended up taking the job. Uh, the head um, officer full-time also happened to be the battalion commander at that time because he didn't always have to be. And I was at the meeting and I said, you know, here you got an op operations sergeant position open. And I said, well, I might be interested in that. He says, well, you can apply and interview and whatever. I said, no, sir. <laughs> said, I have, here, there's the list, 11B, way on the top of the list by a lot of points, me, my job if I want it. The guy wouldn't talk to me. Hmm. You know, we'd walk through the hall, here's a senior officer, the senior enlisted person. Nope, wouldn't even say good morning to me. So it was, it was rough. So <clears throat> all this time that you're in the guard, yep. you still got a full-time job. That is my full-time job. My full-time job was being a soldier. I mean, I got up, did PT, worked every day at the armory. You know, it was the last uh, last guy to leave when we'd go to Fort McCoy. I'd be the first guy in Fort McCoy, and I'd be the last one to leave Fort McCoy. I would be the last one to make sure that all the weapons were accounted for when the unit got to Marinette. <laughs> uh, so, 
So yeah, no, it was it was my full time job. I was active duty, carried a green active duty ID card. Got you know, family had Tricare, um, healthcare, uh, and now every month uh, I get a retirement check because we went past that age. No, I have to have <laughs> mine wasn't age related. Okay, There's a lot of people that are just weekend garden reservists have to wait till they're about age sixty, depending mm -hmm. on if they were deployed. Recent in, in, since 9/11, that could shave some time off of that. But, but mine was because I'd spent 20 years active. I was just like if I'd spent 20 years working in the police department, you can retire at 20 and 50, isn't it? No. So I was at age 46 when I retired from the guard because I had taken a couple part-time years in there. So I was a little older than some. But so you went to Germany in the guards. Now, what other countries overseas did you go to in the guards? Nah, Germany was about it. Other than towards the end of um, end of the uh, Cold War, they didn't have as much. They didn't want to pay overtime to the Thai guys to run the simulation exercise, so we get a weekend off in the middle. So I've been to Holland, really cool, really like Holland, Luxembourg, Belgium. Drove to through France on my way back on a weekend. We did this all in one weekend. France was closed. It was, you know, rural part of France on a Sunday morning. We're running back to our base and you know, highly Catholic population and there was nothing open. So, <laughs> so I say France was closed. Okay. <clears throat> so while you were in service, what uh, citations or awards did you receive? Oh, well, you may find this hard to believe, but I got several good conduct medals. <laughs> good. Uh, my highest award, uh, I received two uh, meritorious service medals. Which are which are up there for someone who hasn't been in in in, in combat and was uh, the uh, numerous army uh, commendation medals and achievement medals and things like that. So okay. Highest rank was E eight. You said E eight. Yep. Master sergeant. I wasn't a first sergeant. I was a, a operations sergeant. But you could fill in for his first sergeant if he had to. I could <laughs> if if. if <clears throat> Whatever they needed, fill in for the sergeant major if need be. But yeah. okay, so everyday life, you're living at home. Yep. Going to work at the armory. Yep. That was basically get up uh, whatever time. You know, when I when I lived in Hartford, you know, was, uh, actually when I lived in Wausau, I was four blocks away from the armory. You know, so you know, get up or leave the house ten minutes before I was supposed to be there. Be home ten minutes after. Being the rank that you were at, supplies were you able to get supplies pretty easily, or a lot of uh, a lot of paperwork. It's being <clears throat> AGR in 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 a lot of the units I was in because they were weird units. You'd um, there's priority system for everything. Mm -hmm. in, in, in in the military, so a reserve unit didn't get allocated the same things that. At certain levels, for a while, I was in a in a FSP unit, which is, was a force support package unit, um, and that was that REAC that was in Hartford and then moved to Berlin uh, when we worked for the Corps. And we'd be there, and stuff would show up. You know, they they back a truck up. You don't have a forklift, <laughs> and here's this big pallet full of something, and you don't have any idea what it is. But uh, you know, you ordered repair parts. You know, whether it's uh, for your your weapons or your systems. One story I had uh, when I when I was part time in, in Oshkosh and I was the company MBC NCO. They had these things um, called mop suits, mission oriented protective posture, and it was a charcoal activated suit with rubber gloves and rubber boots, special rubber boots, which is just horrendous and filters in a, in a gas mask. It was to protect you from chemical weapon. Um, and so I ordered, you're supposed to have on hand contingency, you know, gloves, a certain number of gloves or whatever. Well, I ordered them, well, not being a full supply guy at that time, and the, the, the supply guy didn't catch it, I ordered and didn't know about the item of issue. I ordered an individual number of gloves and what I got was 
that many boxes of gloves. <laughs> so I'm at home because I'm a part-time soldier at this time, and I get a call from the full-time sergeant major at battalion. Yeah, they never call to say hi. <laughs> and uh, wanted to know why I had all these things come in. So, but um, normally, then there's the other side. I mean, when I was in um, the Air Force Communication Center in San Antonio, I had my commander come in and said, hey, I need a, I've got a meeting and I need a VCR and a TV. I said, okay. Come back a couple minutes later, I said, you want black and white color, portable or council, you want me to sign for it or steal it? So, so you know, it's always the same in the military. I mean, you get what, somehow you're gonna get what you have to have. Uh, but no, supplies were fairly easy if you knew how. You'd have to, being in, uh, in that core Rayoc, um, well, when I did that, that computer program in the theater Rayoc, I did it with my own personal laptop that I bought a, you know, from a mail order place. <laughs> uh, when, we, uh, when we were at the core, I mean, we would go, you'd walk in and they're all connected in a LAN. And they've got video conferencing and me instant messaging and all this stuff and guard didn't have any of that. I mean, I needed a, and I can't even remember what it was, a D-Link something, the other uh, router, I'm sure it was. And I needed cabling and I needed test equipment and I needed, and I go to the state headquarters and say, I need this stuff. And they're like, where are And you'd have to go all the way up, you'd have to get a letter from the, you know, you get a letter from the Corps commander, you know, three star, saying, they need this stuff. Mm -hmm. Then it would get it. And then, well, we do things like, you know, airplanes. We need an airplane to get down to Fort Hood. Send a whole Marine Corps DC-8 to pick up these 20 people. They're pretty neat. It's neat stuff. Okay, <clears throat> going back to your Air Force time. You're in Okinawa. Yes. Did you get any USO shows or anything over there? I did see uh, Ray Charles, USO show. Yeah, pretty cool. Enjoyed that. Yeah, very enjoyed. Well, I wasn't a big concert guy before that, uh, and still I don't know if it's. But um, but it, well, yeah, it was very very good. It was it was it was it was, it was a wonderful show. So when you were, <clears throat> you spent two years in Okinawa, Japan yeah. area, did you come home at all? Nope. It's been pretty much there when you took your R&R. Got on, got on, no, there's no R&R. &R. I, I wanted to go on R&R, &R and they said, no, you're mission essential. That's right, you okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, you spent a year and a half, you know, you didn't take really any vacation, any leave. It just built up when you sat there. And, you know, you okay, so now the garden, getting back to that. You're under federal and state. You're, yeah, you are. It's kind of the, it's a shell game. I mean, you technically work for the governor, but, the, but you know, everything's paid for by the feds. Uh, and the equipment's the federal equipment. But the federal government, ha the president has to ask the governor to use you. Just like, but if you're called up from the state side, like the, when I was gone, when I was on active duty, they went to Gresham. They did some riots in uh, in uh, the campus in, in Madison and things like that. Uh, they were called up for active duty. They did some state active duty for uh, the prison system when the prison guards struck. Uh, and none of that counts as active duty for for any benefit. But um, but yeah, so it was a good you know, for being AGR. It was really good. It still is a good deal for. Uh, the reservists, you know, if you spent 20 years, besides getting your weekend drill check, which was really four days pay for two days, uh, you got, uh, if you stayed 20 years, at age 60 you got a retirement, but you also got TRICARE, health care, which is humongous. I mean, anyone out there knows they're between age 60 and 65 and they're thinking about retiring, health care is a big part of that formula. If you don't have it, you better plan another thousand dollars or more to remotely cover that. So, so that was a good gig for the uh, guard and reservists that retired. That now they didn't have it when I was in, but now a weekend soldier can 
can get TRICARE Reserve Select, where they can, for less than their weekend drill pay, they can insure their family for a month. I mean, that's humongous. So you'd recommend guard or active duty service for anybody? No, it's not right for everybody. <laughs> I'm just saying, it, 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 it does have its benefits, but you also could cordially be invited to, uh, to attend a, an all-expense paid trip to Afghanistan. Uh, uh, which I'm surprised. I mean, I had my retirement paperwork in before 9-11. Retired the summer after 9-11. And I thought for sure they were going to recall me to active duty. But they never did. But, you know, so. so it's not for everybody. And each branch of the service and each type of reserve and each unit has got its different personality. But uh, And the same thing with active duty. But it is... Um, it's been very good to me. I've had great karma, you know. I missed Vietnam, going into Vietnam. I was in during the end of Vietnam. Uh, my unit wasn't called up to go to Desert Storm. I was supposed to go to Bosnia, but they mobilized the wrong unit. That Those two reacts split and whatever, and they sent the wrong one. <laughs> Another big weird thing. Um, and I retired before we went into Afghanistan and Iraq the sec second time, so charm career. So now <clears throat> your military service is over. You're the Wood County Veteran Service Officer. Yep. How long have you been in that position? 14 years. 14 years. Mm -hmm. And the best job I've ever had. Amazing. Interesting people that you run into. I ru you run into, you used to wonder when you were in service what happened to those guys that were you're like, how did they ever get in service? Well, they come into my office again. <laughs> but you also ran into those people that just did phenomenally weird, wonderful things for their country. And some of them that have paid dearly for their country. And helping them get what they're entitled to or helping them through a bind in their life has just been, uh, it's, it's wonderful. And I get to do it with other people's money. Well, it's actually all our money, you know, using uh, state and federal resources, but it's, but, uh, it's so great helping them. Did your military career help you in your veteran service officer position? Oh, yeah. Uh, because I was active guard, I did things like in Desert Storm, I was that company that I was in, that 80 man unit with a lieutenant colonel and a, and a sergeant major, ended up being a provisional battalion for, for the units that didn't have an organic battalion in the state. So we had the MP company, two transportation companies, and a medical ambulance company. Well, we sent over 400 troops to Desert Storm. Uh, a lot of people don't know, but the reserve component had a different pay system than the active component at that time. They didn't match. The troops went down to Fort McCoy. They took all their finance records with them, and they were locked up in a bin at Fort McCoy. They deployed. They got a casual payment at Fort McCoy. They might have got another casual payment right before they left. They go into theater. The postal system was messed up, couldn't handle it. Somebody in their infinite, you know, no, I'm not going to bash attorneys, but somebody decided that, well, we can't send their families their LESs, and their LESs, even if they could get them, they wouldn't be able to act on fixing anything. What's an LES? Leave an earnings statement. Okay. So it tells them what they got paid or what they were supposed to get paid, where it went. Those were sitting in the lost mail pile in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, a huge pile, like bigger than this room pile. Uh, so I went down to Fort McCoy, or to Camp Douglas, talked to Jerry Crafton a guy here from Wisconsin Rapids. Uh, he worked full-time as a military technician for the National Guard, and he did payroll. And he was able to get me from the act, you know, the, the pay statements for all 400 of them, but they came out uh, in a unit sheet. And I'd have to tear them apart and then put them all together in order, you know, so here's your pay period from the first 15 days, the second 15 days, you know, twice a month, all the way through, put them all together, then review through it all. 
and then fix those problems and identify the problems and get it back to them, talking to bankers and, and uh, other debtors and their families and, and stuff. So it really was wonderful. I remember my higher headquarters had a major that was our day-to-day uh, -day commander. And one night at 11 o'clock, he calls the Hartford Armory. I answer the phone and says, well, what are you doing there? I'm like, what are you doing calling me if you don't <laughs> expect someone to be here? We were trying to solve the problem. So I learned pay, I learned how to read statements like that, I learned how to read orders. I saw, I, as we mobilized and demobilized them, I saw discharges, I saw medical records, I did uh, line of duty investigations. Um, so it really helped me a lot in, um, in the paper end because I didn't just be, I wasn't just an 11B, you did everything during the week to prepare for that unit going, going to either a weekend drill or an annual training or to war. So you did all that stuff. And so that's the same documentation I'm looking at, and I understand that better than, than some people. Um, I've worked with medical records a lot, not as much as my assistant who I just hired, who will be a topic down the line uh, for you. She's got a medical background, which is one of the reasons that I hired her. One of the many reasons, but okay, so it prepared me to, it prepared me quite quite a bit for this because I had a lot of exposure to different things. So, as veteran service officer, <coughs> excuse me, what would you like to share with people as far as what your office <coughs> can offer and what veterans should be doing? I know you know, with Vietnam, the Agent oh. Orange is very Vietnam, the Agent yeah. Orange. Uh, from the early 50s to, uh, what, I think, 80-something, um, the Camp Lejeune veterans with the, with the toxic water, the Gulf War. Uh, don't just, the biggest thing is don't suffer on something you might think might have been related to your service. Come and see us, and we'll investigate, and we'll try to see if we can, one, get it fixed, you know, whether it's a health thing or, or whatever, uh, and two, maybe throw some money at it, because money always is reducing some of that financial stress might be. But if you don't know what you don't know, come and ask, because we can't read your mind and we can't find you uh, wherever you are. We try, but we can't, you know, go pounding on your doors and say, hey, are you okay, or whatever. Come and ask, and uh, maybe, Maybe we can't help you, maybe there's, it's not related to service, but maybe it is. And I, we do this every day, you don't. You've got your other life to do. This is our life to help you. And uh, we do it every day, come and ask us. The same thing if you're enrolled in VA healthcare. The doctor can't, or, or, or the nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant, they can't read your mind. And they can't do every test in the book until you say, hey, this is what's going on. Or, and then they can, and it doesn't have, when you're in VA healthcare, it doesn't have to be service related. If you're enrolled in VA healthcare, any, any healthcare issue from uh, dementia or uh, a planter's wart, anything they can help you with. So, but you gotta ask, you gotta let it known that you need that help or you've got this concern. And then we'll, we'll resource, re research it and attempt to get resources to help you with it. Are you seeing a lot of younger vets showing up in your office now, or are you still dealing with the 40-plus age group? It runs from someone who got out last week and never made it through basic training because they blew their knee out or whatever to World War II veterans, you know, in their 90s, seeking help or trying to plan for their final days or whatever. It's, it, it's, it's total gambit. Um, they all have different needs, they're all in a different place in their life. I mean, the, the uh, Korean and World War II veterans, many of which probably should have been getting service-connected disabilities all the way through, uh, are finally coming in uh, as they are looking at maybe going into assisted living or uh, nursing home care. The Vietnam guys with the, the ones that were exposed to Agent Orange and all the horrible things that that had. Or for that matter, people in that era that were Marines 
and they may have gotten denied their bladder cancer saying, well, it's due to Agent Orange. Well, no, it's due to the water you drink at Camp Lejeune now. So basically every veteran in Wood County should come and see you. If they've got a concern, definitely. You know, at least get their DD-214s if they've got in, the DD on file. 214 on file. There, there, are, there are programs, you know, they may have been in our office 10 years ago. But there are different programs now, state and, and, and federal programs that are, are totally different. And unfortunately, sometimes I can't, we can't help you. You know, we don't have a resource. You don't fit the way that they wrote that uh, program. But a lot of times we can. And if you don't ask a question, it's not a dumb question. It's a question that isn't asked. A program right now may change in five years. It may change in 10 years. So at least make contact with your office and get on file, for lack of a better term. Yeah. A lot of people couldn't get enrolled in VA healthcare because their income is too high. Well, some of those income things changes, but they also added, if you're on Camp Lejeune, bam, you're enrolled. If you're in the Persian Gulf, you're enrolled. Or you can be enrolled. There's special criteria, and those things change all the time. And the money, the money thing, the income changes too occasionally. I firmly believe that at, unless they tear down the VA uh, healthcare system or totally revamp it differently, that they're going to have, unfortunately, because it means a lot of veterans are passing away. It's just just part of the mortality tables. You know, World War II guys and gals are all in their 90s, the Korean War aren't much farther behind, and uh, our, our generation, uh, the, the, me being the end of the Vietnam era, I mean, we're all in our 60s now. Mm -hmm. uh, so as those numbers change, they're going to have more capacity, and they're going to be able to open those financial constraints, I think. Anything else you want to add, Rock? It, it is... Uh, been a pleasure to serve both here in the county but on active duty um, and in the reserves for for the country it truly has been wonderful to me and I've met a lot of wonderful people but I'm one of those you know these guys you guys don't you know we don't ask directions we don't if I don't see you for five years I'm still a friend of yours and five years when I bump into you hey it's just like we never met but I'm not seeking people out type thing so I do talk to one guy occasionally uh, in Missouri that I went through AIT together and we're stationed in Okinawa together, but not a lot. Even with the social media, the Facebook and Twitter. I don't have time for that. I mean, I'm at my desk or at meetings or whatever. Or, you know, I'm talking about evenings, not during the workday. Oh, <laughs> you haven't met Mrs. Larson. She doesn't, you know, by the time I get home, it's her time. Okay. Because you know, I've gone enough to meetings and I'm gone enough to, um, so I don't really play too much in social media. I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't have a Facebook account. Uh, um, it's just, I, when I get home, uh, I've spent, already spent eight hours looking at a computer screen. I don't need to, although, I, although she complains I am, but when I'm at home, I'm usually looking for a car part or, or how to fix this or that toy that I'm playing with. And, okay, Rock, thank you. A pleasure. Thank you for your service. And thank you for yours. And thank you for watching.